Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Vanderbilt University's 2012 Senior Class Day. Please welcome to the stage President of Vanderbilt Alumni Association, John Hindle. The President of Vanderbilt Student Government, Adam Meyer. Chancellor Nicholas Zeppos. And your 2012 Senior Class Day Speaker, Mr. Tom Brokaw. Families, friends, faculty and staff, honored guests, and class of 2012. My name is Aladdin Osmondisi, and I am the president of the Interfaith Council. I'm honored to speak in front of you all on this special day. On behalf of Interfaith Council, I congratulate you all on your hard work in getting this far. And as a member of class of 2013, I look up to your achievement and I seek to emulate it in my final year at this great university. I've come to learn during my three years at Vanderbilt that the world is complex, it's complicated, and achieving goals we set for ourselves will be difficult. And we may feel at one point of our lives that achieving goals will be impossible. I'm often reminded by a quote by Muhammad Ali, who once said, impossible is just a big word thrown around by small men who find it easier to live in a world they've been given to try to explore it and find the power to change it. Impossible is not a fact, it's an opinion. Impossible is not a declaration, it's a dare. Impossible is potential. Impossible is temporary. Impossible is nothing. The struggle to achieve our goals is what makes them worth achieving. And as you depart Vanderbilt, view the obstacles in your life not as obstacles, but instead as challenges. A visceral call to action. Confront the challenges. Embrace them. And work tirelessly until you overcome them. I think the challenges we face in life are what makes life worth living. Thank you again for giving me the privilege to speak to you all today, and I wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. Take these next few moments to consider your collective journey and achievement as four of our peers share thoughts from their religious traditions. Join me in welcoming Sneha Venkantraman from the Hindu community, Carly Whitgrove from the Jewish community, Mohammed Ruri from the Muslim community, and Ben Wyatt from the Christian community. Thank you. Namaste, and thank you, Aladdin, for that wonderful introduction. I am honored to be speaking today on the behalf of the Hindu community. I had the chance to read the Bhagavad Gita, a holy scripture of Hinduism, in a class at Vanderbilt last semester. Its wisdom from millenniums ago tells us to follow our dharma, the individualized path for which each of us is here on earth. No matter where we end up next year, Vanderbilt has given us, the class of 2012, the tools to excel in each of our own definitions of success. Whether it's taking a gap year to travel or heading full on into our job or graduate school, we are still and forever heading full on into our dharma and taking the next step towards achieving our dreams. To close, I would like to recite one of the most well-known prayers in Hinduism. Om Bhur Bhuvaswaha Tat Savitur Parinyam Pargo Devasya Dimahi Diyo Yona Prachodayat May the supreme light that illuminates the earth, the sky, and the heavens also illuminate our intelligence and direct the rays of our intelligence to the path of virtue. Thank you.
I'm honored to be here today to welcome you on behalf of the Jewish community here at Vanderbilt. In Judaism, we have a tradition of recognizing new and special events with a blessing. We say Shehechianu to commemorate what we've accomplished and celebrate where we're going. Seniors, we've made it this far. Congratulations. Please join me in recognizing and appreciating this moment. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Shehechianu Behigianu Behigianu Lazman Hazeh. Blessed are you, our God, for supporting us, protecting us, and bringing us to this moment in time. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Rui from Muslim Community. I'm going to be reading two chapters from the Quran or Quran. But before I do that, on behalf of Muslim students at Vanderbilt University, uh, we would like to express our deep appreciation to fellow students, faculty, and staff of all religions and faith for expanding our intellectual knowledge and understanding to strengthening our so turning our will to understanding, respect, peace, and love throughout the world. I'm going to be reading uh, chapter one. We call it in Arabic Al Fatiha, which means the opening. And the second one, from chapter 87, uh, in Arabic we call it Al A'la, or it means the Most High. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبح اسم ربك الأعلى الذي خلق فسوى والذي قدر فهدى والذي أخرج المرعى فجعله غثاء أحوى سنقرئك فلا تنسى إلا ما شاء الله إنه يعلم الجهر وما يخفى ونيسرك لليسرى فذكر إن نفعت الذكرى سيذكر من يخشى ويتجنبها الأشقى الذي يصل النار الكبرى ثم لا يموت فيها ولا يحيا قد أفلح من تزكى وذكر اسم ربه فصلى بل تؤثرون الحياة الدنيا والآخرة والآخرة خير وأبقى إن هذا لفي الصحف الأولى صحف إبراهيم وموسى Thank you. My name is Ben Wyatt, and I welcome you all on behalf of the Christian community at Vanderbilt. For Christians, the pursuit of knowledge is fundamentally good, because through knowledge we come to understand ourselves, the world around us, and our relationship to God. But the Christian tradition also recognizes the effort and perseverance that's required to obtain knowledge, 
As Ecclesiastes 12, 12 says, writing books is endless and much study wearies the body. Yet Christians are also encouraged not to obtain knowledge in a vacuum, but to couple their strength with compassion, their idealism with courage, their knowledge with wisdom. In our time together at Vanderbilt, I have been privileged to see so many of you carry out this very synthesis in your classroom projects, your activism, and your leadership in student groups. So let me congratulate you all, not only on the work and dedication you have displayed obtaining knowledge over these past four years, but on your commitment to use that knowledge to leave behind a kindly and creative impress on this school, this nation, and the whole world. Allow me to share with you a blessing from the sixth chapter of the Book of Numbers. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Congratulations to all of you and good luck. Good morning. I'm John Hindle. I'm president of the Vanderbilt Al Alumni Association. And on behalf of the alumni and the alumni relations staff here on the campus, I want to congratulate you on completing your course of study and welcome you as the newest active members of the Alumni Association. As a citizen of the United Kingdom as well as the United States, I'd like to borrow from Winston Churchill to set the tone for today's events and to reinforce what our faith leaders have said earlier. At a very pivotal moment in the history of Britain, when the tide of the Second World War began to turn with the defeat of Rommel in North Africa, Churchill made a very famous speech at Mansion House in the city of London, in which he said, now is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end. But it is, perhaps, the end of the beginning. And in a real sense, tomorrow is the end of your beginning. You're not the same person you were when you walked through those gates on West End Avenue. Vanderbilt has shaped and sustained you through your time here as you've deepened your sense of self, acquired the knowledge and skills to survive in a fast-changing world, and built relationships that will endure for the rest of your life. So all the ceremonies this week really mark the end of your beginning and the beginning of Vanderbilt for life. You see, from my perspective, you've been alumni in training for four years, but tomorrow you turn pro. Tomorrow you leave the community of students, faculty, and staff on this fabulous campus to join the global community of Commodores, 130,000 living alumni of Vanderbilt around the world, making a difference every day in every field of human endeavor. And I think that calls us to consider for a moment what it means in the wider world to be a Commodore. To me, it means upholding the enduring values of community and civility that inspired Commodore Vanderbilt's founding gift. Community and civility, values that have united the Vanderbilt family for 139 years, values sorely in need of renewal today in our society. Being a Commodore means striving for excellence and maintaining integrity in all that you do. And it also means accepting your personal responsibility for the future of this great institution. In a very literal sense, you're all now equity stakeholders in Vanderbilt. You've invested your time and treasure, or perhaps I should say your time and your parents' treasure, in a four-year-long project. And like all investors, you'll want to see the value of your investment grow. So I challenge each of you today to recognize and accept 
a personal duty of care and stewardship for your alma mater. Alongside the thousands of alumni whose generous and sustained support made your experience here possible. As you trace your personal journey with Vanderbilt in the future, bear in mind that not one of you would be here today without their support. But as individuals in a class, you will shape and sustain Vanderbilt too through your lifelong involvement with the university and with students and friends. In fact, you've already started by being the brightest, most promising, most talented, most generous, and most diverse group of students ever to graduate from this great institution. You've already raised our averages and increased our collective potential. You are the living brand of Vanderbilt, and your fellow Commodores are proud of your achievement. In closing, I'd like to point out that although we're not a big school, we Commodores are a global family. Counting you, there are now 130,000 Vanderbilt alumni in 141 countries around the world. So whether you're studying or traveling or looking for work or just trying to find friends in a new city, think Vanderbilt because we're there. Whether you're in Dallas or Delhi, Los Angeles or London, Korea or Kenya, think Vanderbilt because we're there. Vanderbilt is everywhere you are and everywhere you'll go, shaping and sustaining you. That's what it means to be a Commodore. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Fellow seniors, parents, squirming siblings, friends, university faculty and staff, congratulations to everyone. It is truly an honor to present on behalf of the Senior Class Fund this morning. The Senior Class Fund is the senior giving campaign where seniors are able to make their first gift to the university to any area, department, or student organization on campus that has been meaningful to them. It is a way to say thank you to a place that has given us so much over the last four years and to ensure that future generations of Vanderbilt students had the same opportunities and experiences that we've had. I must first begin by thanking my fellow officers, a truly outstanding group of senior leaders who have worked tirelessly to change the culture of giving on this campus. Kate Googe, Matthew Taylor, Tessa McLean, and Paige Cobbs along with our wonderful 60-person committee, none of the accomplishments of the Senior Class Fund would be possible without the efforts and hard work and dedication to the university that you've given us. I can't thank you enough. Now, to the fun part. Historically, participation in the Senior Class Fund has hovered around 20%, with the class of 2011 setting a record at 32%. Well, being the first class of the Commons and the best class at Vanderbilt, obviously, we set an ambitious goal for the class of 2012, 40% participation. It is my pleasure to announce to you this morning that we have upheld our reputation as a record-breaking class. Over 668 seniors, or 44% of the senior class, has made their gift. Our success is a testament to the passion our class has demonstrated throughout our student experience and of our strong desire to leave a lasting mark on this campus. I want to thank each and every one of you from the bottom of my heart for your participation. You are truly changing the culture of giving on, on Vanderbilt's campus, and our class has once again made Vanderbilt history. And with that, I would like to, thank, to ask Chancellor Zeppos to please join me at the podium. On behalf of the class of 2012, I would like to present you with this banner containing our signatures. We are grateful for the opportunities you have helped create during our time here, and we look forward to having a long-lasting relationship with the university. So thank you. Thank you.
Good morning, friends, family, faculty, and staff, and last but not least, my fellow graduates of the class of 2012. My name is Adam Meyer, and I have the honor of serving as a student body president this past academic year. Now, most of us graduating tomorrow arrived nearly four years ago. Like many classes before us, we were told that we were Vanderbilt's best and brightest, coming from all over the world, bringing our various cultures, religions, and interests to campus. Although each of us is indeed an individual, tomorrow we will all walk across that stage as graduating class of Vanderbilt Commodores. We all chose different paths throughout our time here. Some spent time volunteering around Nashville or even around the world. Some working in medical facilities and hospitals on cutting edge technology. Some engaging with Vanderbilt's academic greats, working on phenomenal research and many more. Regardless of that path, we were each given the chance to individualize our experience so no two were alike. We had different classes, extracurriculars, dorms, contributions to the university, and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, our class leaves tomorrow sharing an immensely rich undergraduate experience. Our class opened the Ingram Commons. We realized the dream of many before us to find a fully implemented college halls program, whereas every class coming after us will never know of Vanderbilt without college halls. We experience a unique set of years in the limbo between the old and new. The old Vanderbilt, where first year students were spread across our campus, struggling to create a class identity. The new Vanderbilt, where first year students were centralized into one of higher education's greatest experimental successes, geographically uniting members of our class, dispelling the notion that learning only takes place in the classroom, and exemplifying that college was more than just four years of classes, but rather a four year experience beginning on campus yet lasting a lifetime. Our academic achievements are too many to tout, but our class tomorrow will graduate tremendous scholars, including six Fulbright scholars, one Rotary scholar, and numerous future leaders in business, political, medical, and academic worlds continuing to spread the Vanderbilt name around the globe. On the field, our athletic achievements define success. Two football bowl games in four years a men's and women's SEC basketball tournament championship, the baseball's first trip to Omaha, our nationally ranked top 10 women's cross country and golf teams, our NCAA runner-up women's bowling team, and many more accomplishments that enable us, the class of 2012, to say that this has, without a doubt, been the most successful four years in our athletic history. As we walk across that stage tomorrow, we will remember Vanderbilt, its professors, staff members, administrators, current students, and other community members that made this the best four years of our lives. It is now our responsibility to leverage all we have learned here and strive to better the world around us. We were all successful in our own ways these past four years, yet our successes are just a taste of what we will find moving forward. It is these differences and unique results that make our class so strong. Moving forward, each of your successes are our successes, and each of your triumphs are our triumphs. Vanderbilt is stronger because of the way our class meshed and thrived, illuminating the path for future classes to follow. Now, college might be the best four years of our lives to date, but we have plenty ahead to live, and will do so largely in part utilizing all that we have learned here at Vandy. Let us not forget where we came from, where we are going, and the people responsible for helping us bridge that gap. And always remember, go doors. And with that, it is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce the leader of our beloved university. Chancellor Nicholas Sepos has been with Vanderbilt for nearly 25 years, beginning his tenure as an associate professor of law in 1987. Since then, Zepos has served as assist associate dean of the law school, associate provost, provost and in 2008, he was named the eighth chancellor of our university. Chancellor Zeppos' dedication to the university is unrivaled, his desire to improve our school unmatched, and his passion for enhancing the experience for all who come to campus is truly remarkable. Over the past four years, I've been privileged to see him in action, in the classroom as his student, and outside the classroom as a partner in bettering our university. With that, 
Please join me in welcome, welcoming Chancellor Nicholas Zeppos to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you so much for those kind words, and I extend a warm welcome to all of you, graduates, their friends, their families, and other members of our university community who join us as we celebrate Senior Day. What a privilege it has been to partner with Adam in the governance of this great university. He goes by VSG President. I call him the mayor. As student body president, he has done a remarkable job of working with university leaders to ensure the very, very best Vanderbilt experience for every member, every member of the undergraduate community. Thank you, Adam, for your dedicated leadership and exemplary service. I also want to recognize and thank Aladdin Elsa Medice, Snehak Venkatraman, Mohammed Rui Rossley, and Ben Wyatt. Your blessings beautifully affirm and exemplify Vanderbilt's commitment to sustaining a community in which students of all faiths and all walks of life are respected, honored, and accepted to participate fully in all of the many opportunities found on this campus. And for his leadership of the university's more than now 130,000 alumni, I extend the deepest thanks to John Hindle, the president of the Vanderbilt Alumni Association. I would also like to recognize Sloan Speakman for chairing the Senior Class Fund and to thank all of you seniors who contributed to this generous gift that will enrich the Vanderbilt experience for the next generation of students. Thank you very much. Now, for all of us, Commencement Week represents a true celebration of Vanderbilt's mission of engaging and serving our greater society through education and discovery. On this special day for you, Senior Day, the university recognizes the humanitarian work of an individual who has enlightened our existence and whose unique contributions have quite simply made our world a better place. We honor this person with the Nichols Chancellor's Medal, which was created and endowed by our distinguished alumnus, Ed Nichols, and his wife, Janice Nichols, in dear memory of Ed's parents, Edward Carmack Nichols and Lucille Hamby Nichols. I would like to take a moment for all of us to recognize Janice and Ed, who have joined us today, and thank them for their philanthropic vision in establishing the Nichols Chancellor's Medal. <laughs> On behalf of Vanderbilt University, it is my distinct privilege to present the 2012 Nichols Chancellor's Medal to legendary journalist, essayist, and author Tom Brokaw. Since, since 1966, and I was glued to the set as an 11 year old, Mr. Brokaw has built a distinguished career at NBC News gathering and reporting world events. While for most of us, today marks the very first time to meet this American hero in person, after decades, of course, of welcoming him into our homes and hearing his calm, measured delivery of the day's news, we really think of Tom Brokaw as a member of the family. Thus, we welcome him to our Vanderbilt campus with a sense of familiarity, like a trusted friend. Throughout the years, Mr. Brokaw has engaged our hearts and minds through balanced and insightful reporting, and he represents the epitome of enlightenment through education carving out a distinctive role as one of our generation's most notable documentarians, 
he has explored domestic issues ranging from racial separation in America's neighborhoods to illegal immigration. And he has traveled the globe to meet with world leaders in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, and Saudi Arabia to illuminate the complexities surrounding the war on terror. Through his vital work, he has informed our understanding of the injustices and inequalities that create distance in our ability to relate with one another as individuals and as countries and within the various social political groups that define our personal and collective entities on this earth. In his landmark books, The Greatest Generation, The Greatest Generation Speaks, and An Album of Memories, he not only coined a term that will for eternity be linked to the men and women who came of age in the Great Depression, he also brought well-deserved honor to the quiet heroes who valiantly served our nation in World War II. For his masterful work in revealing the distinctly human issues that connect us with our neighbors, near and far, and for inspiring our capacity to recognize the invisible threads through our life's journeys, it is my distinct privilege to welcome Tom Brokaw and present him with the Nichols Chancellor's Medal. I am delighted, I am delighted to announce that Mr. Brokaw is donating a portion of the cash prize associated with this medal to the Robin Hood Foundation, a nonprofit devoted to fighting poverty in New York City and providing a consistent force for good in the lives of New Yorkers in need, many of whom we must remember are our nation's veterans. He is also donating a portion of the prize to City of Hope, an independent biological research treatment and education institution fighting courageously to conquer cancer, diabetes, HIV, AIDS, and other life-threatening diseases. He makes this donation in honor of his good friend and colleague, Bob Pittman, CEO of Clear Channel, who is this year's recipient of City of Hope Spirit of Life Award. Mr. Brokaw, Tom, we applaud your philanthropic vision, and we are honored that the cash prize of the Nichols Medal, Chancellor's Medal, will add strength to these great humanitarian causes. Please join me in welcoming Tom Brokaw. Tom. Well deserved. Thank you, Mr. As I say, as I say, it's so nice to say it, and it's all true. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to hear. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that these ritualistic ceremonies require ceremonial headgear, so I am happy to become part of the Vanderbilt family today. Let me also say that I am so impressed with how this ceremony began with the representatives of all the parts of the Vanderbilt family. Let me also add that it's an enormous relief for me as a speaker to be here at Vanderbilt because if I were to be at that other lesser school in Knoxville, <laughs> I'd have to speak more slowly and use shorter words for the audience there. I have a confession to make. I think, as a student, I could not have gotten into Vanderbilt. And I thought about that. I've wondered, as I have wandered the last 50 years in that wilderness reserved for people who do not have a Vanderbilt education, I, I've wondered what success I might have had in life had I been able to come to Vanderbilt and get a degree from this university. And I've learned a lot about Vanderbilt in the last couple of days. I've learned that you do have an official student and university motto. It turns out you also have an informal one. What happens at the Dan McGuinness pub stays at the Dan McGuinness pub. <laughs> Let me begin by saying to all of you, welcome. Welcome not just to this ceremony, and all that it means in terms of the pride of your family, your parents and your grandparents and aunts and uncles who are here today. 
welcome especially to the class of 2012 because we need your help. It is self-evident that we have not given you a perfect world. But what I love about these ceremonies, and they're taking place in so many places across America today, in large elite universities like Vanderbilt, small community colleges, the public universities that are in every state in the union, what I love about these ceremonies is that they are the essence of the American dream that every generation will have greater opportunities and a greater education than the preceding generation. And they are, in its own way, a renewal of who we are. We're an immigrant nation. We saw that on this stage as we began these ceremonies. And we renew ourselves every year with these ceremonies because we unleash on the world the best educated, the most ambitious, and the most tolerant generations that mankind has ever known. No, his, no nation in the history of sovereign nations has as many of these kinds of ceremonies going on simultaneously, educating as many of the young, prepared to take their place, not just in the corporate headquarters, or in medical schools or in law schools, but to take their place in the firmament of America as citizens. We are entering a daunting time. Think about your lifetime alone. In the last two decades, the United States has been involved in the two longest wars in its nation's history against suicidal terrorists who believe that they are somehow defending their faith. Our role in those wars is diminishing but that rage continues to burn. And while less than 1% of our population volunteered to fight those wars and paid a terrible price on the battleground and in their families, when you stop and think about it, unfortunately, no sacrifices were required of the rest of us, none. Well, the students of the class of 2012, and I fully appreciate that because I was one myself, while well, you were chilling on the beach in Florida worrying about your tan lines, or at Rippy's trying to figure out how you were going to get to class the next day given the condition you were the night before, <laughs> these young fellow Americans, all volunteers, most of them from working class families, representing families that had served in previous wars in Vietnam. Vietnam and Korea and World War II, they were locking and loading weapons, putting on Kevlar vests and getting into striker and Humvees and going off to the most hostile combat conditions in the history of warfare in this country. They were doing it not just for one tour, but three and four and five and six tours. And they were leaving behind families who were terrified the phone would ring with unwelcome news or that there would be in the driveway an army vehicle delivering a chaplain with unbearable news. And when they came home, so many of them came home to a society that had changed profoundly since they left. The skills demanded in the workplace were much different. We had gone through a severe economic downturn. And so many members of their communities had moved on with their lives in a way that these young warriors could not. While they were away, the rest of us at home went on a governmental and personal spending spree that took the American economy to the brink of a Great Depression. When the collapse came, many ran for cover and blamed the other side. Well, here's something to remember as you begin your new life as Vanderbilt graduates. We're all in on it, and the only way out of it is together. Those of us who are civilians and those that we welcome back into our society who have served us so well in foreign lands. We can begin by honoring the service and sacrifice of those in uniform, embracing them personally, economically, and culturally as they come home. They need jobs and emotional support. And most of all, 
They need the gratitude of all of us, their fellow citizens. In a democratic society, it is unjust to have two distinct classes, one in uniform and in harm's way, the other with no requirements of service or sacrifice. So graduates of Vanderbilt 2012, as you step into your new role as full-time citizens, you can have an immediate impact by correcting this wrong. We'll need from you big, bold ideas on how to make public service in America at your age, if not mandatory, at least more universal than it is today. Here's a thought. Why not have public service academies just as we have military academies? Public service academies in partnership with the private sector job training, and the common cause in one package. Here are some more changes to contemplate in your lifetime alone. When you were a toddler, graduates, China was trying to recover from the trauma of crushing the student revolt in Tiananmen Square. China has made, as we all know, astonishing economic gains in a very short time, unprecedented in the long history of nations. It's frankly a privilege to be witness to that, but it's also more than a little unsettling. And as we're seeing again, China's leaders are much better at GDP than they are at BHR, basic human rights. Remember, for those of you who are young and so many of you in this audience today who were at that time conscious of what was going on, remember that iconic photograph of a young Chinese man standing in front of a tank right after Tiananmen Square. He was armed only with his courage and will, and when the tank tried to move, he moved with it. He was a brave and still anonymous man about the age of the graduates who are here today. Well, think about this. He was not sending that tank a text message or tweeting them. He wasn't asking them to be his friend. What he did was put his life on the line for the rights to think and act freely, and he gave us an enduring reminder of all that we in this country take for granted. He had to act on his own because we did not yet have easy access to the power and the potential of something that we take for granted every day, the Internet. There were not yet smartphones, no Facebook, no Twitter, no YouTube for that young man. Life is like that. Big, important changes happen at warp speed, now faster than ever before because it is fueled by the power of that information technology in which a keystroke can ignite a revolt or share a medical breakthrough, create a merchandising empire, buy a movie ticket, or even meet a mate. Those of you who are graduating from Vanderbilt are the masters of this technology. For the first time, really, kids are teaching their parents to drive. But these are just tools. And to be effective tools, they must be an extension of our heads and our hearts. As powerful and as exciting as they are, I can promise you they'll never replace the first kiss. No text message can compete with a whispered, I love you from someone you care deeply about. You'll not find racial or social justice in a search engine. You'll not eliminate global poverty by hitting delete or affect climate change by cutting and pasting. Remember this as you go forth. It will do us little good to wire the world if we short circuit our souls. Steve Jobs, Bill and Melinda Gates, Sergey Brin and Larry Page of Google, Jack Dorsey of Twitter, Mark Zuckerberg, and Sheryl Sandberg, who's the CEO of Facebook, would be the first to acknowledge that they were constantly in pursuit of big dreams and not small distractions. They were addicted to innovation and excellence. They had big brains, but they also had big passions. That is the DNA, not just of game-changing entrepreneurs, but also of 
physicians and teachers, lawyers and merchants, bankers and accountants, social workers and soldiers. And about that new world that you're about to enter, your parents and professors have been calling it the real world. They know something and I know something that we're prepared to share with you. It turns out the real world was junior high. <laughs> Stop and think about it. All the petty jealousies, the insecurities, the cliques, the dorky behavior that you encounter there will be part of your life for the rest of your days. <laughs> Remember the cute guy with all the charm who figured the world owed him a living simply because he was so charming? He's still gonna be around for your 20th reunion, still winking at everyone, wearing his baseball cap backwards, still waiting for everyone else to do the hard work. And the girl who couldn't stop checking her makeup mirror every 30 seconds, all the while saying, oh my God, oh my God, 20 years later, she'll still be doing the same thing. <laughs> the more interesting classmates from your eighth grade year will be the dorky guy who was a chess whiz. He learned Mandarin and built his own computer, and he often had to eat lunch alone. He may arrive at your reunion in his private plane worth a gazillion dollars because of a new app that he has invented. Or the girl with a single mom who worked nights at Krispy Kreme to help support the family and still aced her SATs. She could come back as the CEO of a major bank because guys, and you should take notice of this, the 21st century is going to be the century of women. Their gender is on the cusp of the greatest gains in history, permanent and welcome gains. And together, you're all entering life on a smaller planet with many more people as a result of this new form of communication, a planet nonetheless still rife with conflict and the consequences of it. You're also starting this phase of your life after the searing and disorienting experience of the economic sandstorm that altered our landscape and shattered an inflated sense of security. It is a daunting environment in which to be unmoored from the comfort of family and campus, but it is also, and this is the most welcome part, an unparalleled opportunity to create a new reality for a new century. It may seem bewildering at this moment, a combination of apprehension and excitement. In an election year, you'll hear the siren call of those seeking your vote and money that they have the one true path to righteousness and salvation for a troubled land. In a complex society of so many interests, ideological certainty from the left to the right and back again can become another form of tyranny. Bart Giamatti, the late president of Yale, a man of such range that he was a renowned Renaissance scholar, but also the Major League Baseball commissioner, would like to say to students graduating from that lesser institution on these occasions, you may be bewildered. You may not know what you need to know. He said you should go from here only wanting to wish to know. That's what we ask of you. And then he would tell the graduates, whatever you do, do not become one of those who has the courage of other people's convictions. In a half century, as a journalist and as a citizen around the world, I have come to one sweeping conclusion after witnessing the great triumphs and tragedies of recent history. No one has all the answers. We're at our best when we have common cause. The genius of this immigrant nation in which everyone, including the indigenous people, came to this magnificent landscape from elsewhere. The genius is that we're at our best when times are tough and we rise above divisions to become more than the sum of our parts. So leave here today with your individual dreams and your passions, but with a common vow to leave an indelible imprint on your time. 40, now, 40 years from now, historians will make a judgment about our national will during this critical passage. They'll examine not just the legacy of President Obama, 
or the campaign of Governor Romney. They'll make a judgment not just about John Stewart or Stephen Colbert's monologues, or God forbid, the place of the Kardashians in our life, whatever that happens to be. These historians are going to take the measure of each of us. Were we worthy of those who went before us, those who gave us the rule of law, a just economy, political choice, and the greatest social movement of my lifetime, the civil rights movement? You leave here prepared by fellowship and a great institution to master your destiny and leave an indelible and welcome mark on your time. So as you go forth, I ask you to think of enlisting as citizens actively pursuing your individual interest, but also the common good. Leave here caring for each other because you will spend the rest of your days together in one form or another. And remember to love your mother, Mother Earth. She's the only one that we all have. In 1968, when I was a young journalist and thought the world was coming apart, 16,000 people, our fellow Americans, were dying in Vietnam that year, including one of my very closest friends. Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis. Bobby Kennedy was murdered in Los Angeles. The streets were widest in Chicago at the 1968 convention. One of the presidential candidates was George Wallace from Alabama, who campaigned on a platform of unalloyed bigotry and the promise of violence to anyone who stood in his way. By the end of that year, I wondered whether we could ever recover our equilibrium. And then Apollo 8 was launched. It was a rendezvous with the moon to prepare for man's first landing on the moon. And one of the astronauts was Jim Lovell, who later became famous as Tom Hanks, <laughs> and saying, Houston, we have a problem. Jim Lovell grew up in Milwaukee with a single mom and a Murphy bed in a small apartment, and he dreamed of going to the Naval Academy, becoming a Navy flyer, a test pilot, and going into space. And all of his dreams were about to be realized on that occasion, two days before Christmas in 1968. And they launched for a rendezvous with the moon. And after a high-speed orbit of the Earth, they shot through the inky darkness of the lunar landscape, where no man had ever seen the backside before. And when they got out there and looked out their portals, they couldn't see the moon. And Houston did a small correction, tipped over their spacecraft, and there it was. The gray, lifeless surface of the backside of the moon, never before seen by mankind. The crew dropped their flight plans and ran to the windows to just stare wordlessly as they drifted by. And as they came out the far side, there in the distance, in this utter void, was a small, beautiful orb the deep blue of the oceans, the delicate filigree of the white clouds, the rust brown of the arid areas, and the rich green of the primordial forest. It was Mother Earth. And Jim Lovell said he looked at that for just a long moment and put up his thumb, and he could hide the entire Earth behind it. And at that moment, he had a revelation he thought to himself, that is our spaceship. We're all in this together. And indeed we are. So shoot for the stars and become the next greatest generation. Thank you all very much.
Thank you, Tom, so much for that remarkable speech and for distinguishing us with your presence today. Your words really do inspire us to expand our knowledge and to seek our role in that greater world, that dot in the sky behind someone's thumb that surrounds and supports us every day. And now we will continue this great commencement week. Now the day, of course, is filled with receptions and ceremonies and times for nostalgic walks across the campus, all, of course, for you to enjoy and to honor all the graduates of the 10 colleges and schools of our great university. Additionally, for the families and the students, beginning at 2 o'clock this afternoon, tuition free, you'll discover a wonderful series of lectures delivered by our great Vanderbilt professors who really do shape this world. And I encourage you to take some time out to participate in these intellectually stimulating conversations led by these world-class professors. Seniors, families, friends, but particularly seniors, enjoy this special day dedicated to recognizing your spectacular achievements and our hopes for your future. And I look forward to seeing you bright and early in the morning with the sun shining outside. Thank you. Thank you for attending this year's Senior Class Day. We again invite you to the faculty seminars held in Wilson Hall beginning at 2 and 3.15. If you purchase box lunches via commencement website, you may pick them up at Rand Dining Hall today until 1 p.m. Shuttles will run from Memorial Gym to the parking garages until 45 minutes after the conclusion of the program. We invite you to attend the faculty seminars held in Wilson Hall following this morning's program. Seminars start at 2 and 3.15. For more information, please refer to your commencement handbook or your senior class day program. Have a Twitter account? Be sure to hashtag number VU2012 on all your tweets. Follow commencement on Twitter at VU Graduation or via Facebook at Vanderbilt Commencement.